there's nothing everyday or ordinary about Disneyland. Think about it, where else can you go visit a jungle or head off into outer space, catch a pirate battle, travel the rivers of America, and encounter giant rodents all within a few feet of each other? The whole place is unusual. The whole place is strange. Which makes choosing just five weird things in, at, or about Disneyland very difficult. But that's exactly what we're going to do today. Find five weird things at Disneyland. Now in the past when I've done this, and it's actually been a few years now, I've always tried to find sort of silly, wacky things that are in the park today. Like the world's strongest baby. Weird. But today I'm going to break the rules a little bit. Because there are some things in Disneyland's past that are so weird. We've got to mention them, even if they happened nearly 70 years ago. Which is exactly the case with our first weird thing. Located right here on Main Street, USA, in Disneyland. Unlike today, nearly 70 years ago, back in 1955 when the park opened. These buildings weren't full of Disney-branded gifts and merchandise. Instead, many if not most were leased by corporate sponsors who had displays of their own merchandise. You had pianos advertised in this building. At one point, Hills Brothers Coffee had a little coffee area over this way. The old lockers, which were located in the corner past the Emporium. Right over in this area were sponsored by moving companies. First, Beacons. And then later, Global Van Lines. There was the Yale Lock Shop, where you you could literally buy yourself a custom front door key from Disneyland. This building just to the left of the Penny Arcade was once the Sunkissed Citrus House where you could get the freshest squeezed orange juice. You had the underwear shop, which we'll save for a future talk. And on and on and on. The list could go on forever. In fact, there are still some lessees over here on Main Street USA. Most notably two of them, one of them, is the Main Street Magic Shop. I believe that's still run by a concessionaire. Which is why it still has more interesting stuff in it than just you know, the usual Disney merchandise. And you have the Carnation Cafe, sponsored, of course, by Carnation. But that's not what we want to talk about. What we want to talk about is this building right here. Because today's a Fortuosity Shop, which of course is nowadays full of the usual Disney theme park merchandise, was once, or I should say was originally when the park opened, Disneyland's Drugstore. You can see here that things have changed quite a lot, but this was originally the Upjohn Pharmacy. Upjohn is a pharmaceutical company that still sort of exists, but back in the 1950s when Walt was working on Disneyland, he was pumped. Springs weekend retreat buddies with the managing director Donald Gilmore from that company. And so, of course, when he was looking for okay. corporate sponsors to help construct okay, Disneyland, who better to turn to than some of his buddies? And although it's been heavily remodeled today, this area once looked like this. The Upjohn Company actually scoured the country finding all kinds of old artifacts to construct a pharmaceutical museum in here. Well, there was also a separate section that showcased modern pharmaceutical technology, but the key attraction was the old museum area. And if you can believe this, they actually had real pharmacists on staff in here from the Upjohn Company that could answer your questions about pills and drugs. In fact, thanks to theme park historian Ken Stack, I actually have a very rare photo of the inside of the Upjohn pharmacy. Look at all those volunteer pharmacists back there talking about drugs. And if we flash forward to today, boy has that counter changed. The whole room has been completely reconstructed and obviously there's no more display case full of old medicine and old items. But there's something even weirder, even more unusual and frankly sort of mind-blowing that used to go on in this pharmacy. Because this is the very room in which they used to give you free drugs at Disneyland. Okay, to be fair, full disclosure, I'm using the term drugs a little loosely here, but, but stick with me. Once upon a time, back in 1955, were you to come into this room, you would be offered one of these. Now this is a free sample, courtesy of the Upjohn Company and Unicap. And in true old-timey fashion, because keep in mind all those old bottles full of old pills and old cures, what you would get in this box is actually, and I gotta be careful with this, this is a original is actually an old glass bottle here of free pills, free vitamins. So you can see here the Upjohn logo on the box, the Disneyland logo, and there are still actually vitamin capsules left over inside of here. And here's the thing, if you open 
Ooh, this bottle. These pills still smell just like a modern multivitamin. Wow. My buddy Ken Stack was saying I should eat one of these vitamins, and I was pretty tempted to do that on camera at least until I noticed the expiration date was in 1970. And these pills were advertised as lasting for a long time. But I think that might be a little too expired even for me. Inside that box also came this little tiny paper here, a souvenir of Disneyland with information about the Upjohn Company, about your free vitamin tablets. There's actually a lot of history and information about the old pharmacy that I was showing you pictures of just a moment ago. Those are, by the way, Upjohn's pictures. They were on old postcards they used to give away for free. But the point is this, at Disneyland, one, used to give you something for free. Whoa, weird. My, how times have changed. Pretty rare when that happens now. And also, once walk into an old pharmacy in Disneyland, and yes, Get free drugs. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty weird. Oh, and also another weird thing, over on the counter, they had live leeches in their museum. That's right, there were live leeches at Disneyland in the 50s. On purpose. Weird. All right, say goodbye to the pharmacy. And for our next weird thing, we don't have far to go. We're just going right across the street to the old market house building over here. Now, I've shown this in a time travel episode. I've shown you old footage of it from back in the 50s, where I explained how what is now Starbucks used to be an old 1890 grocery store sponsored by Swift Food. So it was the Swift market house. And Swift mostly made things like lunch meat, hot dogs, all kinds of kitchen stuff, you know, food. They would sell sort of penny candy in here and other pieces of Americana, but for the most part, it was just set up as a display, much like the pharmacy museum, with all kinds of old general store type items, although you could buy pickles and such like. From the pickle jar, and this over here in another very rare photo from the Random Land collection, is actually the butcher shop. Oh, that's right. It was roughly right back in that general area. That was the butcher counter. And in fact, if we pop outside, just for one more second. This little building next door, the one that says fresh baked goods on it. As you can see in this old Dave Land photo, used to say butcher shop right above the door. Okay, that's pretty weird. In fact, I kind of think that's weird enough in and of itself, but that is not the weird thing. Inside of the market house, among the other sort of displays and penny candies and a few things they did sell, the newspapers mentioned them selling candy meat back in the day. Now I've heard all kinds of weird arguments about this. I've met people who swear back in the day that the butcher counter actually used to sell real meat and you'd buy meat and then just go walking around Disneyland, which doesn't make much sense until you realize they used to have fishing in the rivers of America and you could actually catch a catfish and people were walking around with their smelly catfish in the in the late 1950s here. So, okay, maybe they might have had some meat over here in the market house. And back when I did the time travel episode, I mean, I scoured the internet for any pictures of candy meat, any closer pictures of the counters in here. As you can see, my rare photos, they're pretty good. You can see all kinds of the displays and stuff, but you can't get a very good peek at what's on offer, what's for sale in here. So one of my friends was like, maybe it's some kind of dish candied meat that they don't make anymore or something. Maybe it's just something old timey we don't know about. Well, it turns out, no. In fact, you could walk into the market house here, which, by the way, has been very greatly expanded to fit Starbucks inside of it, and buy candy meat. Look at this ultra rare photo from the Stuff from the Park blog by Patrick Jenkins. Look at this. Those are Swift Market House Red Wagon Yummy Weenies Candy. Those are candy hot dogs. Well, once I knew to search for Red Wagon Yummy Weenies, I was able to find this eBay curious old tumbler that has another picture of them. And these are modern pictures, so you can see the hot dogs aren't in the best shape. That is 1950s cane sugar candy in the shape of hot dogs, packaged the way they would package hot dogs back at that time, for sale right here in Disneyland. Disneyland candy meat? I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. That is weird. Oh, and also, by the way, you know these phones in here? These 1890 party line phones? You could actually pick up the receiver and listen to an 1890 conversation. Boy, that's really loud, actually. Both over here on the left side and over on the far right side, kind of next to the entrance over here, right off of Main Street, USA. These phones and those recordings were playing back in the 50s. They were actually here in the market house, which you can see in another photo from the Dave Land collection. Go check that out. That's a little pro Disney history, old school tip right there. So just to recap, not only did you have a general store where you could buy pickles and you had a butcher counter here at Disneyland, but you also could buy candy hot dogs. 
Now that is freaking weird. And I didn't even tell you about the whole room they had devoted just to a birthday cake in here. We'll save that for another time. Oh gosh, it smells so good in here, you guys. It's like coffee. Oh. Well, actually, I guess, I guess all coffee shops smell like coffee. What else would it smell like? Idiot! All right, let's leave Main Street USA now in search of more weird things. The last one's gonna be a doozy. It even involves murder. All right, next up is something that's been talked about a bit. Maybe it's been talked to death, but I promise if you stick with me all the way till the end, you're gonna learn something and see something almost no one has ever seen and nobody ever talks about. What I want to show you and what I want to talk about are the transitions between lands, of which this one might be the most extreme. I mean, how do you transition between a turn of the last century Main Street USA and a jungle land on the other side. Is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? It had never been done before. But as you can see, they found a way. They started changing the plants. Look at this. The plants become a little bit more jungly and then bam, all of a sudden, there's the transition point. Now this transition right here between the Tiki Room and of course the Jolly Holiday over there is the most extreme. But if you think it's extreme and abrupt, now, you should have seen it back in the day before they built the Tiki Room. Look at this pre-1962 photo sent to me by Terry Peterson. Way back in the day, I've been sitting on this picture forever. Look at how extreme that transition is. As you can see, half of what's now the Jolly Holiday sort of bakery goes right in to the old Tahitian Terrace on the other side. Now that is one crazy, weird looking building. Now I stop here first, not because it's the weird thing, but just because this is the easiest transition to sort of highlight and show you. But there are, of course, others like right over here where you go from Adventureland into Frontierland. Look at that transition. Nobody ever really talks about that one. Or how about this? Have you ever noticed the exact spot where Frontierland becomes New Orleans themed? Now, if you've never been to Disneyland, of course, we have this whole Wild West area known as Frontierland. And then if you keep walking and walking alongside the rivers of America, eventually way over there, you'll get to New Orleans Square, which is sort of a dense, sort of urban New Orleans style area. But even before they built New Orleans Square at the tail end of the 1960s, there was already a New Orleans themed area right over here at the edge of Frontierland, which is this set of buildings right here. Back in the day, this little strip of buildings was commonly known as New Orleans Street. And it was sort of almost like a food court in a way because there were several restaurants over here. First of all, the original Frito House was over here in these buildings, which by the way, getting close to them, can you see the New Orleans influence now? And you could get the 1950s version of authentic Mexican food over here. And then beyond that, where this fancy wrought iron gate still exists, this building was another corporate sponsorship. This was Aunt Jemima's Pancake House. Now they've only just recently quit making Aunt Jemima's pancake syrup, but we won't get into that. I don't do sex politics or religion or any controversial stuff. But not only did they have Aunt Jemima's Pancake House, out here, they also had an actress portraying Aunt Jemima who would walk around this area of Frontierland. And by the way, although it's now called the River Bell Terrace, this menu uh, frame, whatever you want to call this right here, the signpost, is actually the original Aunt Jemima's Pancake House signpost. They used to have the Aunt Jemima menu right in there. Okay, that's pretty weird. That should have been a weird thing all by itself. But what I was intending to point out, the weird thing I was intending to show you, is that by the time you get over here to the River Bell Terrace, you're pretty much fully in a New Orleans themed area. You got Pirates of the Caribbean, New Orleans Square beyond there. And look at the fences. This is what's gonna be important. Look at all the fancy wrought iron, sort of French style, New Orleans style iron work there. The question is, when did that start? We were just in the Wild West with wooden fences. Look at this walking back towards the Golden Horseshoe. Notice the railings over there. They're all wooden stone like the old west. And then here's where things start to change. Notice the wooden railings in the background. And they have this sort of plain kind of walkway railing in front, sort of distracting you, sort of bamboozling you. Luckily, I'm too boozled to bam. Keep your eye on the back fence because all of a sudden you'll notice right here at this pot, it changes. And that is the exact moment you go from the old west and the wild frontier into the more sophisticated, civilized, and urban New Orleans. Kind of amazing, because going backwards, like I said, they have this in the front sort of distracting you, and then back here, this is on top of brick, 
But if you go all the way back, they got the wooden railings over the stone, so it's a sort of weird, funky, gradual, strange transition. I know we're not done yet. Stick with me, stick with me. We're gonna go backwards in time a little bit here, starting with the present day, the modern lands. Like the entrance to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge over here give themselves a lot of room for transitioning from old west rocks into sort of weirder and weirder space rocks. And the transition is so gradual and so sort of seamless, you almost emerge into Star Wars land thinking, how'd I get here? Now going backwards, a bit 40 years ago they redid Fantasyland and as you can see even back then comparatively recently they didn't leave a lot of space for a transition it's pretty abrupt but they use these backstage wooden gates that look sort of Western and sort of Fantasyland ish that's a nice transition it works it works they had a little room to play with so it's a good transition point but there's one zone one sort of area one sort of transition in Disneyland I don't think they ever knew quite what to do with because between Fantasyland and Tomorrowland they built this the mighty Matterhorn Mountain now of course the Matterhorn is sort of European sort of storybook kind of themed. It fits right in with Fantasyland, but it straddles the line between Fantasyland and Tomorrowland. And because there's two lines, one on each side, they sort of had a line coming from Fantasyland and a line coming from Tomorrowland. This wasn't the only attraction. On this same border between Fantasy and Future, they had a couple more rides, which actually literally entered into both worlds, including the motorboat cruise. That's the old dock right there. Of course, you had the monorail eventually, and that's clearly a Tomorrowland attraction, but under Underneath the monorail right over there and round about the motorboat cruise, you had not one, but two Autopias now today. The Autopia, which is sort of the miniature car ride out here at Disneyland where kids have a chance to drive. Seems like a straightforward fantasy, fantasy land type thing. But remember back in the 50s, freeways were pretty futuristic. So they actually had two Autopias out here. They had a Tomorrowland Autopia and they had a Fantasyland Autopia running right next to each other. So no one's ever really been able to decide which land does the Autopia belong to? Still a mystery. Now, of course, they've combined it all into one Autopia and it all leaves from Tomorrowland. So it's a Tomorrowland attraction. But with the Autopia right there behind me, the Matterhorn here right across the street, after 1959, bumping right into the submarine lagoon, this little corner here between the three attractions was sort of a weird, fuzzy gray area between lands. Now, there have been so many changes out here since 1959 that the transition feels almost seamless. You go from the Rocky Mountains and the Submarine Lagoon over into this nice, you know, tree-lined pathway. It's also shrubbery covered that, uh, you know, it kind of bamboozles the mind. But this history of being an awkward transition point has sort of a physical remnant back here behind this temporary bush they put here for some sort of private event tonight. And it's gonna be kind of awkward to show you and get to, but we're gonna give it our best shot. Right back here across from the Matterhorn line, next to the Submarine Lagoon, right back behind all these fine people. This covered up corner back here is the meeting point of three different fences. You got three different fences meeting right down there where I can't get, of course. This fence right here is from the year 2000, roughly. This is the Autopia fence right there. Behind these temporary shrubs where you can't see. This is the 2007 Finding Nemo fence, right? So they added this in 2007 when they changed the uh, submarine ride into the Finding Nemo attraction. And these two fences are meeting in that back corner with a third fence, a true relic, a true remnant of the past. It's only a little tiny chunk of fence, but this is sort of a big deal. This right here is the 1959 Autopia fence. This fencing, which you can see right there is very mid-century, mid-20th century, is uh, left over from the glory days of Walt's Disneyland. Walt's big Tomorrowland expansion with the monorail, the Matterhorn, the submarines. This is a piece of Disneyland history hiding in plain sight right here at the convergence of three eras of fencing. You got the 1950s and then you've got a couple from the early 2000s when Disneyland was really starting to change forms. I am really annoyed that these temporary bushes are in the way and I can't show you the inside juncture where you can see all three fences, but luckily Jason Schultz, who literally wrote the book on Disneyland, well, many books on Disneyland as I understand it, recently posted this picture online and check that out. Look at that crazy, three fences meeting together. Now that, my friends, is pretty weird. Now this is a cool Disneyland secret. This is one of those Disneyland secrets that I've never talked about and I love coming and showing people this little chunk of old school Autopia 
fence. That one I've known about forever. I didn't realize, though, about the meeting of the three areas of fences until I saw Jason's post. So this fence I knew about, the three fences meeting, that was new to me. That is pretty exciting. And yes, I think it's a little bit weird, but now that I've told you all this and I'm standing here getting all excited about this little chunk of fence right here, I'm realizing even weirder than the meeting of the three fences itself is me standing out here with plenty of amusement park rides and food and everything else around me. And that's what I'm excited about. So I guess this is more of a weird secret and the weird thing out here is me. All right, now that took a bloody long time to explain. That was a little bit weird and it took a while to get there. So for the next one, we'll keep it a little more short, a little more simple. And this one, we're going back to old school five weird things. Those of you who've been watching this channel for a long time, and this is the 11th year of this show. So there's a lot to go back and see if you've never seen it before. But anyway, those of you who have seen the old school five weird things episodes will recall that some of the previous entries were things like weird trash cans, weird bricks on the ground, just random stuff. Yeah, the weirdest thing about those videos was the weird guy making them. You got that right, Ed. It was more just about weird things that most people don't notice when they're at Disneyland. And in that tradition, I'd like to take you all the way to the back of Fantasyland to another abandoned old school Disneyland relic. Now, I filmed this 10, 11 years ago. I filmed a whole episode about the abandoned remnants of the old Skyway that ran between Tomorrowland and Fantasyland over the skies of Disneyland, a beloved attraction they took out in the 90s. And up until the 20 teens when they were constructing Star Wars Land, right back here beyond Casey Jr., back in this back corner, up on this hill behind those tents, which by the way, that hill has been totally reshaped now, used to sit the old abandoned and sort of derelict Swiss Chalet, the old Skyway station back here. Now, now, right here at the exit to Casey Jr., literally right at the dead end of the exit, is one of the old stairway entrances and exits, I think this is actually the exit, for the Skyway Station. You can see there's still three little steps to nowhere right there, and this little walkway right here. I believe that was the exit for the Swiss Chalet. And because it's sort of right there at the exit to Casey Jr., a lot of people see this, people still take pictures of this, but around the other side of these little food tents is another abandoned piece, an even bigger set of stairs. This was the entrance stairway, and look at those stairs, sort of shaped like logs. These are old school Skyway stairs, although of course the path now leads to nothing, Needs, leads to rubble, rocks, stuff like that and it's the rocks i want to talk about not the abandoned skyway stairs i don't know how they haul in these big granite boulders but those are cool those are you know i've seen those before granite boulders but what in the world is that that is a fake rock right there my friends and we'll get back to that one because that's not the only fake rock right here within spitting distance because right over across this little stairway right back there next to that seating area look at the size of this fake rock now that one is huge it's not even the right color that one sticks out like a sore thumb now fake rocks are pretty common you can buy them at home depot and they usually cover things like sprinkler controls or fire hydrants in this case actually just on the other side of the wall for that transition point we were talking about earlier you can see a rare fire hydrant out in the open over here. They try to paint it that no see em green color so that they sort of blend into the background. But like I showed you in my five weird things at Magic Kingdom in Florida video, sometimes they have fake barrels over them, fake rocks. Now that giant rock there is unusual because it's the wrong color. It's in a weird, awkward spot right there. So it's obviously covering up something relatively temporary. I'm not gonna lift it up and look at what's underneath it, although I am awfully curious. It's actually the small rock that I think is even weirder. You want to know why? Because this rock right over here happens to be a rat trap. Now, any place this big with this much food, of course, you're going to have rodents around and you're going to need to have some traps out there. Oh, wait a minute. Wasn't the whole idea behind Disneyland? Where does Mickey Mouse live? This is Mickey's place. And Mickey Mouse is a giant rodent. You wouldn't think you'd find rat traps in the kingdom of a rodent, would ya? And there's the real rub. Chip and Dale better watch out because apparently Mickey is very jealous of other rodents in his kingdom. Mickey trapping rodents? Weird. Okay, it's, it's not that weird, but I told you some of these are just silly, okay? All right, we're almost to our final thing, and this rock makes me think of murder. Now, that's not the first word you typically think of when you think Disneyland, because, of course, Disneyland is the happiest place on Earth, and that's a fact, but it's also a fact that every single day at Disneyland, right at sunset, so technically every single night out here, is a murder. And to show you what I mean, we're going to have to wait for the sun to go down. Shh. 
Now it's time for our final weird thing, and this is sort of a Disneyland secret. Every night, when the sun starts to go down in the west, every night when the shadows get long and the light gets low, something begins to happen at Disneyland. Now, if you're gonna look at an aerial photo of Disneyland today, you're gonna see it's surrounded by city. It's just locked in, landlocked with all the suburbs and the motels and the businesses everywhere. The bustling city of Anaheim, the bustling county of Orange. But flashback to aerial photos from the 1950s and even in the succeeding decades, and there was still a lot of farmland around Disneyland. Don't forget, this whole place was built out of orange groves. Well, primarily orange groves. There were other crops here, but we'll get into that another time. So anyways, Disneyland comes along and they build this. The Rivers of America and all kinds of water features all over the park. And what does that attract? Birds, you got ducks, you got swans once upon a time. You got cormorants and all kinds of weird birds, pelicans, all kinds of things land over here in Rivers of America and different parts of Disneyland, submarine lagoon. You've got seagulls, pigeons, all kinds of bird life flocks to Disneyland pun very much intended, not only because it's a great place to get scraps of people food on the ground, but it's also a safe place to nest. Not a lot of natural predators inside the berm. And, and here's the important part, as the landscape around Disneyland began to change, as all those farmers' fields and wild areas began to be concreted over and turned into all these Orange County suburbs, Disneyland became more and more a sanctuary for all kinds of tree-dwelling creatures because of its large trees, the water, like I was saying. Back in 1955, from the air, you would have seen this little gray area of all the buildings of Disneyland and then lots of green around it. Now it's the opposite. Disneyland stands out as the big green area surrounded by tons of gray cities and concrete and buildings and whatever. So that means as more and more of the farmland around here dried up, more and more birds found this their only place of refuge. Especially one kind of bird in particular, the farmer's bane. Crows. In the 50s with all the farmland around here, Anaheim had a normal amount of crows in the surrounding area, you know, your usual. But we're not living in the 50s, we're living in the future. And remember that aerial photo. All that farmland has now disappeared, which means every night out here at Disneyland, and particularly in the front of the park, thousands upon thousands of crows who spend their day out there pecking at trash and apparently digging up my front yard. I don't know why they're always digging up my front yard. Thousands upon thousands of crows make their way back here each night to the relative safety of Disneyland. Now look at that tree up there. Looks normal, right? Wait till you get closer. These trees are absolutely littered, and I mean filled full of crows. And this is just the beginning. The sun has barely just started to go down. And we're just standing here in front of the Opera House looking at a few trees. I'm telling you, the entire front of the park, all the trees in the Jungle Cruise, they all fill up with thousands of crows. Look at this, it does not matter where you are. If you're anywhere near the front of the park, you are going to be surrounded by the sounds of crows. They are everywhere. Don't think they're not in these full leafy trees too. They are all over the place. Look at them literally flocking out here to Disneyland. Like I said, this is an island in the storm. Back in the day, all these crows, this crow population would have been spread out all over different farms, different fields. What little bit of woodland we have in Southern California, but as all the wild areas shrank back, instead of the crow population going down, they simply use this as their home base and then fly out all over Orange County in the daytime and cruise back here at night. Look at that, here they come. Flock after flock, group after group. Oh, wait a minute. What is it that a flock or a group of crows is called again? I'll tell you what a group of crows is called. A group of crows is technically, scientifically called a murder. Now my grandparents lived across the street from here. My mom grew up across the street her whole life. I spent the first half of my life growing up across the street. My dad went to high school and lived over here across the street. I had annual passes to Disneyland when I was a teenager and stuff. And so I always knew about crow time and that's what I would call it. Oh, it's crow time, which is either time to go if you've been here all day or time to go in to the park if you want to be a night owl. Oh, more birds. And so many, many times in uh, different videos, old vlogs, old periscopes, when I used to do live streams and stuff, I'd walk out here and mention, up oh, crow time, which either meant it's time to go or time to get going down to the park, depending on whether you're doing a daytime or nighttime thing, like I was just saying. But unlike Jimberly, which is the name I gave, you know, my friend there on Main Street, which stuck and everybody uses, Nobody ever seemed to catch on to crow time. No matter how many times I talked about it, I never hear anybody else talking about crow time. 
until one day, my friend Ken Stack from Stack's Liberty Ranch was going, oh yeah, you know, the nightly murder at Disneyland, and I cracked up. All these years of crow time, and I never once thought about the fact that a group of crows is called a murder, and there are multiple murders in these trees right now. There's a murder every day and every night at Disneyland, and that, my friends, is weird. Plus, speaking of weird. You know how I was just telling you how my family lived across the street from Disneyland? Actually, three different sides across the street, depending on which grandma and, you know, my dad or my mom growing up and me growing up. The reason I told you all of that is because my brother obviously grew up around this neighborhood with me too, but he was over here at Disneyland the other night and he starts texting me, dude, there are thousands and thousands of crows out there. I was like, yeah, it's crow time. Remember crow time, you know? And he's like, no, what are you talking about? So for some reason, my brother just skipped his mind, but I've always enjoyed crow time. By the way, yes, you can get uh, bombed out here if you're not careful, but there's sort of no way to really shelter from the crows. You just gotta get in the park. The farther in the park, the more they're scattered. But here's the weirdest part about all of this, about all of these crows, is that every night they come flying in here from all over Orange County, right? From the hills to the ocean and everywhere in between. And then they'll all gather here for a little while. When it gets good and dark, when the sun's all the way down, they'll all lift off and take off. So they don't sleep in these trees all night long. They take off for somewhere else to sleep. This is like literally where they come for their evening muster. This is just where they get together in their murders to hang out for a while before they disperse. They stay in the park at different parts of the park and different areas. How's it going? Just not all up here in the front. And it's weird that they gather at the front gate, almost like they know they gotta scan in before they head off to bed. It's like a crow army. Seriously, it happens out here like clockwork. Right when the sun goes below the horizon, whether there's clouds, whether it's sunny, rain or shine, the crows all start streaming back to the front of the park out here. And if you manage to come out here right after the sun dips below the horizon, you're gonna see this on a nightly basis. And it's way more birds than they've got in any animal park. All right, so that is it. That is our fifth weird thing. What did we have? We had free drugs at Disneyland. We had candy meat at Disneyland. That is pretty weird. We had the transition points meeting of the three fences and me being weird about nerding out over a, a fence. I guess that's a little weird. We had the rock of rats, infinite sadness, and now we've had the nightly murder at Disneyland. And look, here they go. Here they go. All scattering and fluttering around just because the train happened to come through. But soon they'll take off for other parts. Now, like I mentioned, this channel, this show has been going for 11 years. We've had several other five weird things videos in the past. If you want to go search those up. And of course, we may have, whoa, look at them go. Many more in the future. And over the years, many people have either asked me, well, that's loose. That's that's also weird. Uh, have either asked me when is the five weird things coming back, or have sent me many suggestions for five weird things. But I wasn't doing it at that time, so it's back. So if you have any other weird things at Disneyland, DCA, Epcot, Magic Kingdom, Animal Kingdom, anything weird, anything out of the ordinary, anything unusual, feel free to send it in. Feel free to get in touch, leave a comment, do whatever you need to do. But for now, guys. Our mission is finished. We saw five weird things at Disneyland, and now it's crow time, which means it's go time. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget, there are tons of videos on this channel, more than a thousand, going back more than 10 years. Travels to Disneyland Paris, uh, Magic Kingdom, and Disney World in Florida, all over the United States, Marceline, Missouri, where Walt Disney grew up, all kinds of stuff. And it's completely fan-funded. Everything comes through Patreon, so please check out the links down below. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with a friend you think would like it. It's harder and harder to get people to see this stuff these days. And if you help me out by giving me the thumbs up and sharing with a friend, well, we'll keep doing this for many, many years to come. But for now, we've done our duty. You can crow home and sleep well. Check out the birds!